back to the book, the new year had arrived. Jangling frost lay over Stalingrad, over the Stalingrad pocket and breathed its icy, deadly breath. The sharp wind blew through the joints of doors and windows and in the bunkers, and from the floors the cold crept up to one's knees. The daily casualty reports from our divisions that increasingly reported losses other than by enemy action represented a shattering balance on the death sheet. So what he's saying there is like, yeah, people are dying from combat, but even more people are dying just from cold and starvation. Yeah. Again, the Russians furiously attacked several sectors of our perimeter. What did we have left to oppose these powerful Russian elite troops who were protected from the frost and had a full stomach, not to mention their numerous tanks, guns, rocket launchers, and mortars? Only small numbers of heavy weapons with insufficient, strictly rationed ammunition. It's all we had. Only emaciated men, exhausted by hunger, among whom the fighting, the cold, and spreading diseases were taking a daily frightening toll. How much longer could the perimeter withstand the pressure? It did not escape our attention that the Russians appeared to be concentrating in front of our sector in preparation for a major blow. The last sod, sad possibility grew even clearer on the dark horizon, the fate of our destruction by a shattering offensive breaking over our heads. So again, it's interesting that this guy's, <clears throat> well, two things I should point out. Number one, it's interesting that this guy's perspective because he's in the staff and so he sees more of what's happening from the general officers. Mm. But let's also make note that he's not on the front lines. And he's so he has it relatively good, meaning he's protected by the by the rush from the Russians by some distance. I mean, he's still getting mortared, et cetera, still getting artillery, but he's not he's not eye to eye with the Russians like the guys like the soldiers on the front lines that are sitting in a a little slit trench in the ground in the tundra. Mm. One of the things that he sees is is a meeting. Here we go back to the book. An important meeting of the general staff took place at our core which the commander-in-chief of the army, General Paulus, attended with his chief of staff. The serious, reserved expression of the tall figure with the head of a scientist reflected something of a burden of responsibility that pressed down tormentingly on the shoulders of this man. It was the last time I was to see our army commander in the pocket. As far as I can remember, he never visited our corps again. I soon learned of the outcome of the meeting and the grave words of our general staff officers left no doubt about the consequences of the orders that had been issued in the meantime. They dealt with the mobilization of the last reserves of the 6th Army. The encircled forces were to hold on and fight to the last. For this purpose, the formation of fortress battalions was to be prepared and executed as quickly as possible. All remaining reserves of able-bodied men were to be collected and used as infantry. Members of the Luftwaffe ground personnel and anti-aircraft troops, gunners who no longer had guns, panzer grenadiers, engineers, truck drivers, clerical staffs, rear echelon, and supply personnel were once again to be ruthlessly combed out. The order amounted to the virtual dissolution of the rear echelon services and clearly demonstrated that the immobilized army was doomed to stay put and fight to the last man and the last bullet. So there you go. Everyone's going to fight. Cooks, supply people, you're all going to become infantrymen now. And this clearly indicates to, to uh, Weeder that that means they're not going anywhere. Yeah. And they're going to stay there and they're going to fight to the last man. 